Designing ships in Space Engineers can be a process that takes as long as you're prepared to spend. To newer players or inexperienced builders, it can seem daunting and challenging to pre-plan and build ships due to all the different elements involved. In this episode of the Space Engineers Handbook, I'll be going over the basics of ship design. This video contains a general guide for all vessels regardless of purpose or size. There will be elements non-applicable to certain types of craft, so pick and choose which might apply to yours. I'm going to start by talking about thrusters. The thruster type you choose will have a major impact on how you lay out your vessel. Ion thrusters are the easiest to build into a ship. They only require clearance on one end and don't have fuel requirements. The trade-off is they don't function well in atmosphere, they still provide some thrust, but it's really not worth their weight. So vessels that regularly transition from planet to space, such as shuttles, may often have ion thrusters but will have supplementary thruster types whilst in atmosphere. Out of the three types, ion is the least powerful. Any vessels primarily space-bound that don't require to accelerate quickly would be ideal for this thruster type. Vessels such as mining barges, freighters, small shuttles, drones, space stations and more. Ion can also be used in a hybrid arrangement with hydrogen to boost a ship's manoeuvrability. As the name implies, these thrusters actually only work in atmosphere, unlike ion which do slightly fire in atmosphere. Atmospheric thrusters sit right between ion and hydrogen in terms of thruster output and don't require any fuel, making them an ideal choice for any planet-bound vessels or frequent atmospheric flyers. They also require clearance just above the intake fan, one block spacing, which is something to keep in mind when building and can make cramming more of them into a hull slightly more difficult as you also can't attach them by this end. Recently we received the flat atmospheric thrusters, they take up less space than their larger counterparts but will produce less thrust. With their smaller profile however, they are far easier to dot around a ship to provide extra thrust where needed or for powering smaller craft. Pure atmospheric crafts like drones, frequent atmospheric flyers or even some rovers would benefit from having atmospheric thrusters. Hydrogen thrusters work both inside and outside of atmosphere, making them extremely useful for ships frequently transitioning. Also, they are the most powerful of the thrusters, enabling vessels to accelerate more quickly. However, they require a constant flow of hydrogen as fuel for the thrusters. This also means that unlike the two other thruster types, Hydrogen thrusters need to be conveyed. These conveyor lines can take up large amounts of interior space in large ships and increase the size of smaller vessels you're building along with the storage for the hydrogen to fuel them. Hydrogen thrusters are best used on warships, shuttlecraft and even heavy industrial vessels that carry large payloads. This brings us neatly onto the next topic, conveyor lines and pipes. A conveyor network through your ship will allow components and fuel to flow between different sectors and system blocks. There are two main types of conveyors, you have small and large. Small conveyors are restricted in what components can pass through them. Some of the large items won't be able to. As a rule of thumb, any ship's moving components shouldn't use small conveyors for the cargo container connections. Large conveyors can move every item or an ammo type. They take up a lot more space on small ships, so are best used for constructors. On large ships, they are the standard. Sorters will allow you to filter items in a conveyor network. You can either blacklist or whitelist certain items and set the sorter to drain all, meaning it will put all the components in a system through the filter and the ones allowed through will be pushed to the other side. These are useful for pulling specific items for sorting systems, separating ores for refineries, or for pulling all the ores out of mining ships when they're docked. There are many ways to implement sorters. Do note, items cannot flow backwards through a sorter once filters have been set. Connectors allow two ships to dock and pass components, fuel and power. There are small grid and large grid variants. These are useful for docking small craft inside larger vessels, 
docking to landing pads, stations, bases, etc. It's a good idea to have at least one external connector on any of your ships. There are three main types of ship weaponry in Space Engineers. Fixed, turrets and custom. The fixed Gatling gun is only available in small grid form. It currently has the highest fire rate of any weapon in the game, firing 700 rounds a minute. Providing a stream of high velocity projectiles, they are excellent choices for drones, fighters that will engage other fighter craft, or point defense custom turrets to screen against fighters and torpedoes. They will shred through light armor, but tougher enemies and especially large grid ships won't take significant damage very quickly. The fixed auto cannon is also only available in small grid form. Its fire rate is lower than that of the Gatling gun, however the rounds hit a lot harder. Auto cannons will do serious damage to small grids and rovers, even fairly effective against large targets when deployed in numbers. I'd recommend these as an alternative primary weapon on fighters expecting more heavily armoured foes, or used within custom turrets on large grid vessels for point defence and assaults. Assault cannons are the larger cousins to auto cannons. They have a range of up to 1400 meters, high velocity projectiles that experience less drop and hit a lot harder. Due to their size, they are typically mounted on larger fighters, bombers, or used in custom turret batteries for warships. Artillery is currently only available for large grid ships, has a range of 2000 meters and fires the largest rounds of the cannons. A hit from an artillery shell will deal significant damage to even large grid vessels. These are most often employed fixed facing forwards on warships such as destroyers, corvettes or gunships. Basically anything that can pivot quickly enough to aim the whole ship. The fixed rocket pod is available for large grid and has a reloadable variant for small grid also, featuring conveyor ports to automatically pull more ammo in. They fire rockets which travel at 200 meters per second and deal splash damage to enemy ships. The rockets are expensive though, requiring uranium, but equally effective at dishing out large amounts of damage quickly. Their greatest drawback being their low velocity. It can be hard to hit fast moving targets, but if you do, they will definitely feel it. These are usually best employed as secondary fighter weapons or primary bomber weapons and used against slow moving or fixed targets. The railgun is the sniper rifle of ship weaponry. There are large and small grid variants with a range of 2000 meters and 1400 meters respectively. The rounds do piercing damage and will penetrate multiple layers of a ship's hull. However, there is not much splash damage so you're relying on hitting a critical component on the way through. Railguns are great for long range sniper style craft and as an opening weapon on large grid ships. Available for large grids only, the interior turret serves as an excellent counter against players and to supplement point defence systems. They can be dotted across a vessel easily due to their small size, however they must be hand loaded as they have no conveyor port and their damage against grids is very limited. The Gatling turret is the standard go-to point defence weapon. With a high fire rate, high bullet velocity and harder hitting rounds compared to the interior turret, the Gatling turret will shred through small grid light armour and as such should be used primarily as a point defence weapon, sometimes being the primary armament on smaller craft. The missile turret fires rockets which travel at 200 meters per second. These are expensive to produce and maintain as the ammo requires uranium. That being said, they deal splash damage and are very effective versus both small and large ships. These can be useful to dot around larger vessels and even used against small craft. If they connect, they'll do serious damage. The auto cannon turret hits harder than the Gatling turret, but shoots more slowly and has a smaller profile with small conveyors instead of large. It's only currently available for small grids. This is a useful turret for gunships or heavy fighters to supplement their firepower. The assault cannon turret comes in both large and small grid form. It's cheap, durable and easy to make ammo for. This should be a common sight in any competent fleet. The only area they fall short on is hitting fighters. A skilled pilot will be able to evade pure assault cannon fire. Use them as secondary weapons on large warships and as anti-capital weaponry on frigates and below. Artillery turrets are only available for large grids currently. They fire high velocity rounds with a range of 2 kilometers. The fire rate is slow and the rounds use uranium but the damage they deal is considerable. These should be your main ship to ship weapons on anything larger than a frigate. 
They will of course find difficulty in targeting and hitting smaller, faster ships, but they are supposed to be used against larger vessels and station. As the name implies, they are artillery. Custom turrets can be used in a variety of different ways. It's impossible for me to cover all of the possibilities and keep this video concise, so I'll provide some of the most common uses. We've got point defense ball turrets, consisting of a hinge packed with Gatling guns. These are extremely effective against fighters and can output a serious amount of concentrated fire. Since the block isn't available for large ships, you can make custom autocannon turrets which are great for assaults and against fighters. Refineries and assemblers can be added onto your larger ships for component production. This will allow you to process and construct components on the fly so you can repair or modify your vessel as required. On smaller craft, which won't be interplanetary, this is usually not necessary, and a survival kit can fabricate the basic components, though it may be a good idea to bring some spare parts. Storage will depend greatly on the type of ship you're building. All you need to think about when implementing cargo storage onto your vessel is the difference it's going to make to weight. If you add too many containers and fill them all, your planetary ship may no longer be able to lift off. So test this thoroughly in creative, especially with industrial and freight transports, to make sure they can still operate while laden. If you're planning on heading to space or operating in space, you'll need oxygen and life support systems. An O2 generator can provide oxygen from ice for you, and you can mine more ice to keep this fueled, so I almost always recommend at least one of these. If you're heading out on long trips or interplanetary flights far from home base, take either a survival kit or a medical bay so you're able to respawn. Trust me, losing your ship is no fun. Gyroscopes will allow you to rotate. How many you require depends on the mass of your ship, so test this out when building to ensure a smooth turn rate. Gyroscopes are also incredibly durable, so placing them near the front of the ship is not a bad idea, but mount them to the block behind or strongest block so they don't get disconnected during battle. Antennas and beacons allow your ship to broadcast a signal when powered. You can adjust the range and use this to keep track of your vessels, control them remotely from the antenna, provided you have a remote control block, but will also allow enemies to see you. I'd advise setting a lower range or having an on-off toggle for your antennas for this reason. Ore detectors, much as their name suggests, will allow you to see ores within a radius slider in the settings. This is obviously extremely beneficial on scouting and mining vessels that will search for ores. These work in conjunction with antennas to transmit ore locations outside the cockpit. Cameras can be placed to provide a view outside the vessel and allow for zooming in on locations and points of interest. They are extremely useful to aim forward weaponry, but also see common use for connector cameras and asteroid scouting. Magnetic plates and landing gear are used to clamp a vessel to another surface. These can be used to lock a ship to the ground, a landing pad, or even carry debris and ships along with it. Attached vessels via landing gear will be carried through a jump, which is useful. In terms of docking or berthing, we will cover connector setups, landing pads and hangars for now. Docking ports can be done in various ways. All you need to know is it's important to keep the layout in terms of door versus connection point consistent throughout your fleet so that vessels are able to dock effectively and are compatible. For resource transferring or refueling, you may want a second connector location on the ship either on the underside if the ship is intended to land on planets, or you can add an extendable piston hinge setup to make it easier for tankers to connect for refueling. Landing pads need to be compatible with your small grids. Make them as large as is required to scale with your fleet. Light up the area around the connector and the general space as well to make it easy to land. Hangers, much the same. Scale these with your fighter sizes and allow enough room to get around the vessels for repairs and maintenance, easy cargo access and component storage is also massively helpful. Armour design could be a video in itself, however, some general rules of thumb. Use light armour blocks to bridge structural gaps, cover up weak points and provide a safety bumper between components. Try and imagine how a craft would need to be supported in real life in order to hold together. Use this to create a basic underlying armour layer, then on top of this, add further armour panels to key areas such as around the bridge, the fuel tanks, jump drive or hangar. 
basically anything you want to protect. Then use spaced armor as an effective missile shield. You can use armor panels for this as well, and it looks pretty cool. Finally, I comb over the ship and add heavy armor to areas I really want to protect. Heavy armor uses a lot of resources and very quickly increases the weight of ships, slowing your turn rates and acceleration. So I tend to use it sparingly, but for stations of course, this doesn't really matter. Again, this could be a whole video, but let's go over some key principles. Before you do anything, identify the key features required based on the class of ship you're building. Then based on the scale of that ship, rank the importance of these rooms to the ship's function. For example, I want to build a cargo ship. I would like a hangar, crew quarters, mess hall, cargo bay, engineering room, and a server room. However, its size prevents me from adding all these, so I decide what's absolutely necessary, cargo bay, hangar, engineering, and focus on getting those right first. If you have room left, why not try to add crew quarters or a mess, but focus on fulfilling the ship's purpose well first. For smaller vessels, every block counts. I wouldn't leave any dead space or gaps inside, you can always add more gyroscopes, batteries or fuel storage in these spaces. Use LCD signs to direct players as well, as smaller ships rarely have space for corridors and cohesive interior layouts. For larger ships, definitely use a corridor system. Spend some time designing what you want the corridors to look like and stick with it throughout the ship. This makes getting from one end to the other extremely easy and will massively reduce players' headaches from navigating around those ships. Also, for large ships, if you have plenty of space, focus on increasing the accessibility of the rooms that you have, not cramming more different rooms into the ship. For example, increase your engineering room size, add walkways, ladders, catwalks, clear signs, etc. And make it as easy as possible for players to get around and repair those systems, rather than adding another recreational room or a toilet. Add backup systems, auxiliary power generators, repair bays, large ships should be able to maintain themselves in most cases. For warships, cruisers especially, focus on productive rooms first and make sure you get them right before you even start thinking about aesthetic areas. That concludes this page of the Space Engineer's Handbook. Let me know if you would like a deeper dive into any of these areas of ship design and if you have any questions or want to run your builds by me, please do so via the comment section down below or hit me up on the Discord DMs. Best of luck, please like, comment and subscribe to support the channel and as always, take care, everybody.